Good morning. We're standing in Norwich, Connecticut this morning in the Antic Cemetery. My name is David Oat, and I'm going to give you a tour of this 1800s Victorian cemetery this morning. Uh, the Antic Cemetery was opened in 1844, and the reason uh, for it being open is that the old colonial graveyard, which is located in Norwich Town, by the 1800s had become full and actually overflowing, you might say. And so the city fathers set aside a number of acres on what was the outskirts of Norwich at the time uh, for uh, burials of Norwich citizens, which would include all religions. All people of different religions were allowed to be buried here. Um, it is called a rural cemetery by design, also a Victorian um, cemetery as well. And uh, the rural cemetery is actually an international um, form of cemeteries that became very popular in the 1800s. Uh, these old curvy uh, cart paths, um, and the plantings that were here uh, reflected the divine or the presence of God in nature, if you will. And so that was the reason for setting up these old cemeteries. So come on along with me and we'll take a walk through and uh, hear some of the stories of people who were buried here back in the 1800s. Uh, the cemetery now comprises almost 27 acres, and uh, I would say there are about 25,000 burials here. So lots of stories, lots of interesting things to hear about. I'm standing next to this uh, white marble monument, and this is uh, the monument or the memorial for Joseph Otis. Joseph Otis was born here in Norwich, Connecticut, 1768. And as a very young man, he began working in the mercantile business here in Norwich uh, when he was 12 years old. He worked his way up and became what they called a commission agent, which is uh, their term for a middleman in the import-export business here in Norwich. And as he grew up, uh, he realized that New York City was probably the place that he needed to be. There were more financial opportunities in New York City. So he moved to New York City and established the business there and over time became extremely wealthy. Joseph Otis was a very religious man and while in New York City he became interested in what they called the Sunday School program. Uh, the Sunday School program or movement in the middle 1800s was a process whereby churches would set up a school and the children could attend the school for free. So this gave uh, different classes, especially people who were poorer, an opportunity to have their children educated. They taught religious subjects obviously in the church, but they also taught secular subject material, reading, writing, and arithmetic, and so forth. And that actually spread across the whole country and became the Sunday School movement. Um, <clears throat> let's see, Joseph moved back uh, in his later years, uh, when he was 70 years old, he came back to Norwich, settled, and he had a house on Broadway. So as in his retirement, he wondered what could he do to give back to the community because he'd done so well um, financially in his life. And he thought about that for quite a while and decided what he would do is he would provide money for the construction of a library here in Norwich, uh, which he did. And the library was built on the intersection of uh, Union Street and uh, um, and uh, Church Street in downtown Norwich. It's right across from the City Hall. And this was to be a free library, because libraries at that time, uh, you had to pay in order to go in and borrow the books. So Joseph created 
a free library open to all the people in Norwich. And of course now it's called the Otis Library and it has won national awards for its programs uh, that it provides today. So that's the story of Joseph Otis and the Otis Library that's right here in downtown Norwich. So here we have the monument for Jeremiah Halsey and as you can see this is a sarcophagus style memorial. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, in the, it actually is a tradition that started with the Romans and um, the Greeks before that where they would put their uh, dead in stone containers and uh, called sarcophagus. Uh, the word actually means flesh eater. Um, so the bodies as uh, over time would decompose inside these um, stone sarcophagus. Uh, but that was back in that time. <clears throat> this one resembles the shape of a sarcophagus, but it's solid and uh, it's not open and he's actually interred uh, in front here on the ground. So Jeremiah Halsey uh, was born in Preston, Connecticut in 1822 and uh, he attended the law school at Yale College. And because of his health issues, um, he had to drop out and he moved to Georgia and lived for a time while he recovered. Uh, during that time, he continued to study law. He passed the bar in Georgia, and uh, as his health improved in a few years, he was able to move back to Norwich and pass the bar in Connecticut. He became, over the course of his lifetime, uh, one of the top attorneys in the state of Connecticut, uh, forming a partnership with Samuel Morgan and whose uh, monument, I don't know if you can get a shot of it, but his monument is that gothic looking brownstone uh, located behind Jeremiah Halsey's memorial. So the two were in partnership together. Jeremiah throughout his career rose in the ranks and became one of the top attorneys in the state of Connecticut. In 1853, he served as the Norwich City Attorney. Um, he did that for 15 years. Uh, the following year he married Elizabeth Fairchild from Ridgefield, Ridge Connecticut. Uh, in 1863 uh, he became U.S. Circuit Court Judge. And uh, in 1870 uh, he was elected or selected for the United States Supreme Court. So we have a United States Supreme Court Justice here in Jeremiah Halsey. Um, a few years later, the governor of Connecticut, uh, Governor Ingersoll, appointed Jeremiah to oversee the building of the state capitol up in Hartford. That was in 1873. So there are a number of things that he did throughout his life to support the community. Uh, he was a trustee for Norwich Free Academy. He was also a trustee and he was counsel for the Norwich Savings Society. He was a director of the First National Bank here in Norwich and counsel for Chelsea Savings and the Thames Savings Banks. Uh, he was a director on the, Nor on the New London uh, Northern Railroad Company. A uh, very active member of Christ Church on Lower Washington Street. And uh, Jeremiah passed away in 1892, uh, excuse me, 1896, uh, from a heart attack in the Hamilton Hotel located in Washington, D.C. And um, his obituary uh, says that his funeral was attended by many of the state's uh, dignitary, many uh, people involved in the state government and federal government. He was considered to be one of the top attorneys in the state of Connecticut and uh, a very good friend to people in Norwich. So Jeremiah Halsey. Uh, lies here now in front of this uh, large uh, granite sarcophagus style 
monument. Our next stop this morning is going to be by the monument for Lucretia Bradley Hubble, which we can see right here, this rose-colored memorial stone. Uh, Lucretia uh, was born in 1821 in Hopkinton, Rhode Island, and uh, she was a very uh, early feminist. <clears throat> she made her career as a lecturer and what they called a phrenologist. A phrenologist was someone who studied the bumps on your skull and could, uh, could predict health issues and intelligence and get all kinds of information off the bumps on individual skull, skulls. Um, and so she would go around and uh, that's how she earned her living, by giving lectures and doing uh, examinations of people's heads. Um, she was also a very close friend to Dr. Mary Edwards Walker, who was a well-known um, feminist in the 1800s. Dr. Walker was uh, graduated from a medical school. She was a surgeon, and during the Civil War, she uh, volunteered, uh, joined the Army, and she was a field surgeon, uh, the only female field surgeon uh, that was in the Army during the Civil War. She was, uh, it's interesting that she was captured during one of the battles, spent some time in Andersonville prison, and during a prisoner exchange, uh, she was released, and uh, eventually she was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. Um, and she was one of Lucretia's uh, very uh, best and closest friends often came to Norwich to visit her. So uh, Lucretia, on March 1855, as a publicity stunt, had bought uh, a hydrogen balloon, and uh, she planned on making an ascent uh, in front of a crowd in order to uh, drum up some business and increase the attendance at a lecture that she was going to give later on that day. So, um, her flight took place in Easton, Pennsylvania, and according to local newspapers, uh, she was quoted as saying, uh, I rose, this was following her flight, she was interviewed, and this uh, I got from a local newspaper, I rose with perf perfect calmness to a height of two miles my whole feeling being those of indescribable tranquility and calmness. Over the Delaware River, she began to vent the balloon, because as you go up, of course, the hydrogen in the balloon expanded, and she needed to vent it. Um, but unfortunately, she didn't vent it fast enough, and the balloon burst. <clears throat> okay. And uh, she said that uh, she began to vent the balloon, but the balloon burst, falling several hundred feet. Luckily, it formed a parachute, okay, and she was throwing out her sandbags. She marveled as she slowly descended to the earth. She marveled at the grandeur and the beauty of the scenery around her and was moved to sing a song of praise to the Creator. She landed four miles away in Still Valley, New Jersey. Uh, her flight time was one hour, 20 minutes. And needless to say, her lecture that night was sold out. Uh, Lucretia made several more uh, balloon flights. Um, she obviously bought another balloon. And, uh, but uh, the general public uh, didn't seem to appreciate her energy and her progressive spirit. And so she soon retired from public life and relocated to Norwich, uh, where her husband lived. Uh, her husband's name was Algernon Hubble. He was a local artist here, and uh, he was about 17 years uh, her junior when they got married. Uh, they had a house at 272 Franklin Street. Um, 
Lucretia died in 1907. She was 85 years old, and Algernon died in 1927, and he was 89. So Lucretia is credited with being the first female balloonist in the United States, and she's resting here in the Yannick Cemetery in Norwich, Connecticut. Okay, so I just want to make a really quick stop here by the uh, Newton uh, family memorial, this very large obelisk that you can see here. <clears throat> and one of the curiosities I like to point out is for people who come and walk around the cemetery and look at these monuments, oftentimes if you look at the base, you'll see, like on this one here, uh, the manufacturer or the uh, company that made the monument has put their name on it. So here we can see it's um, J.E. Um, Metcalf and Son, and uh, they're located in New London, Connecticut. So just a little more information that you can pick up by taking a look around and, um, and, uh, and checking out these old uh, monuments. So I'm standing in the Foster family plot, and uh, right next to me you can see the sarcophagus, another sarcophagus-style memorial for Lafayette Foster. Uh, Lafayette Foster was born in Franklin, Connecticut, and he was a graduate of the Brown Law School. Became an attorney here in town. He opened up a law office here, which was extremely uh, successful. And uh, he, uh, he operated that law office here for over 30 years before he finally retired. Uh, during his career, he was mayor of Norwich. He was also elected to the state uh, general assembly, representing the city of Norwich uh, for many years. And uh, he was also selected while he was in Hartford as uh, speaker of the house. Uh, he went on in his career uh, to become elected U.S. Senator in 1854, where he served for 11 years. And in 1865, uh, the 39th Congress selected him as President Pro Tem of the U.S. Senate. Six weeks later, Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, and so Andrew Johnson became president and Lafayette Foster became Vice President of the United States. He served as Vice President for two years, ran for re-election, and was unsuccessful. Uh, and he came back to Norwich to attend his law office here, and he was um, elected Supreme Court Justice to the Connecticut Supreme Court, where he served for six years. Um, Eventually, he did leave because uh, of the age rule. <clears throat> Following that, he, he taught for a few years at Yale, uh, at the law school down at Yale, and eventually he retired in 1876. Um, his house is located on Washington Street, and it's now used as the library. It's the Norton Peck Library on the campus of Norwich Free Academy. Uh, his wife, uh, he married Joanne uh, Boylston Landman, and um, she passed away in 1859. She predeceased him. They also had three uh, daughters who died at a very young age, so it was a sad time for uh, Lafayette and the Foster family. You can see here it says Lafayette S. Foster, 1806 to 1880. Uh, pro Dio et Patra, which is Latin, which means for God and country. And uh, right behind me, you'll see another monument, which depicts in kind of low relief, you can see two angels, okay, who are leading his wife, and you can see the three kids right here, okay, and they're pointing, this one angel has her uh, left hand up, leading them on up towards heaven. It's a really, really nice uh, and uh, uh, spiritual uh, memorial. So I'm standing by the marker 
for Captain Chester Hillard. And uh, Captain Hillard's story begins on January 13th, 1840. Captain Hillard is the only surviving passenger of the ill-fated steamship Lexington, uh, which burned and sank in Long Island Sound. So the story begins in the late afternoon on uh, January 13th, 1840, and it was a very cold day. Uh, there was a nor'easter coming into Long Island Sound, lots of wind and waves, and uh, Captain Hillard uh, had a ticket on the Lexington, which began its journey uh, from the docks on Manhattan, New York. Um, there were 143 passengers on board, and it was carrying a cargo of over 150 bales of cotton. Uh, the Lexington was going to make its uh, usual overnight trip between Manhattan and Stonington, Connecticut. Uh, and as I mentioned, there was a nor'easter blowing, and most of the steamships were being held uh, at their dock in Manhattan because of the rough seas. But the Lexington was designed to handle rough seas, so they decided to go ahead and make the journey anyway. Uh, about three hours into the journey, the Lexington was located off East, Easton's Light in Long Island and uh, one of the passengers noticed that there was smoke and fire coming from the bales of hay. And apparently one of the cotton bales had caught fire being too close to the smokestack. So immediately there was a bucket brigade set up and uh, in an attempt to quell the fire. But with the wind whipping up everything, it quickly spread throughout the ship. And within a matter of minutes, the guide or the steering ropes that allowed the pilot to steer the ship were burned through, and he lost the ability to, start to steer the Lexington. Soon after that, smoke and fire uh, caused the crew to leave the boiler room. And so as a result, the Lexington just steamed on uh, into the night, out of control, uh, unable to, be steer, to steer it or to stop it from speeding along. And so uh, a night of horror and terror unfolded for the passengers and the crew of the Lexington. The cotton bales continued to burn and uh, Captain Hillard, who came on deck with the first uh, alarm, he was 24 years old. He quickly organized a group of people to start throwing the cotton bales overboard in an attempt to give the people who had jumped into the water something to hold on to. The captain of the Lexington attempted to launch the first uh, lifeboat which was filled with people, but because the paddle wheel was still turning, the lifeboat was immediately sucked into the paddle wheel and everybody on board was killed. Uh, at that point, the captain accidentally slipped and he fell into the water as well and was drowned. Uh, the next two lifeboats that were launched uh, had the same effect. They were both pulled into the paddle wheel overturned and the passengers were immediately drowned. So now with the uh, boilers spent, uh, the ship slowly began to lose speed and drift with the tide, and, uh, but continued to burn and people were jumping into the water. This was January, don't forget, in Long Island Sound, the water was freezing. Some of them were able to hold on to bales of hay, other floating debris. Uh, but life expectancy in these waters was measured in a matter of minutes. Uh, finally, around 11 o'clock at night, the deck of the Lexington caved in and uh, the boat began to sink rapidly. Uh, Captain Hillard at that point threw the last bale over and jumped in and grabbed onto it and floated away as he looked back and saw the Lexington sink to the bottom of Long Island Sound, 
carrying the remainder of the passengers who had stayed on board uh, down with it. Hillard managed to float on his bale of cotton through the night, unbelievably, and into the next day. Um, he managed to stay warm by kind of moving around, whipping his hands, as he said, and, um, and keeping himself up on the bale, uh, keeping himself out of the water. And eventually, the next day, a merchant ship by the name of Merchant uh, picked him up uh, at about 11 o'clock in the morning. The merchant also was able to pick up the pilot and uh, one of the firemen uh, later on in the day, one at noon and one at two o'clock. Uh, unbelievably, there was um, the second mate who continued to drift with the tide in Long Island Sound for 43 hours, according to reports, on a cotton bale eventually coming to shore on Long Island 50 miles from where the Lexington sank. And he was able to get on shore, go to one of the first neighboring houses that he could find, knock on the door, and people took him in and, and were able to warm him up, and he survived. So uh, out of the four people who survived the sinking of the Lexington, three were crew members, and Captain Hillard was the only uh, civilian passenger to survive that disaster. Uh, a couple of side notes. Uh, there was a colored lithograph that an artist made of the sinking of the Lex Lexington, which became very popular. Copies of the lithograph were sold throughout the nation. And because of its popularity, the company became uh, uh, actually very famous. The artists were Courier and Ives, which I'm sure many of you recognize. Uh, another note was that <clears throat> Henry Wadsworth Longfellow also had a ticket on the Lexington that night. But the rumor has it that he stayed in his hotel because he was finishing up the poem, which he called The Wreck of the Hesperus. So this is the family monument right here for the Hale family, as you can see. Uh, Ashabel and Mary had a daughter, and her name was Gertrude. <clears throat> and uh, Gertrude was born here in Norwich in 1850. Uh, she grew up and married William Landman, who was 12 years her junior. And William Landman owned uh, Landman and Seven, which was a drug uh, company here in Norwich. Uh, they sold uh, wholesale drugs and also um, patent medicines and uh, were very successful and, uh, ver and a very wealthy family. Uh, William unfortunately had some health issues and uh, so he retired at a fairly young age and so Gertrude and William uh, decided to travel which was what a lot of people did in the late 1800s. They traveled uh, to Great Britain, they spent an awful lot of time in France and especially in southern France and it was during this time that Gertrude took uh, a uh, significant interest in the cathedrals of Europe and especially, especially the religious practices and the spiritual philosophy that surrounded uh, the cathedrals. Uh, in 1903 William passed away sadly and Gertrude came back to live here in Norwich. <clears throat> um, her parents, uh, her father, shortly after that passed away as well. And through inheritance, Gertrude became one of the richest, if not the richest, uh, woman in the state of Connecticut. And um, it was using her influence and her um, wealth uh, that she established a reputation of being an extremely caring, 
um, a person especially for local charities and um, she was also well known through high society in New York City as well. So um, let's see, she, uh, as it says, she traveled amongst New York's highest society order, organizing charity events in the most exclusive hotels. But um, I have to say that she kept a special place in her heart for people in Norwich, which was her hometown. And uh, her Victorian residence, which they called Glanbauer, was located at 218 Washington Street. And it was the focal point at which she hosted many lavish and elegant events. So one of the things that Gertrude did uh, later in her life was that she was instrumental in bringing the National Red Cross office to Norwich. And uh, she actually invited a woman by the name of Mabel Broadman, who was the chairman of the National Red Cross, to come and stay in, New in Norwich at her home <clears throat> on uh, Washington Street and spend some time here, get to know the people of Norwich, get to see the city, and uh, Gertrude entertained her. And by the time she left, she uh, was convinced that they should open uh, an office right here in Norwich, which they did. Um, another uh, uh, thing that G Gertrude gets credit for is establishing the TB sanitarium here in town. So when the state legislatures debated where to put the sanitarium in the state of Connecticut, Gertrude organized a number of women to travel to Hartford uh, to go to the public hearings at Hartford and speak out. And they were able to convince the legislatures up there to vote and locate it uh, right here in Norwich. Using her wealth and her influence, uh, Gertrude also established what they called the Hale Club. Uh, the Hale Club uh, was located on Main Street in Norwich. It was a three-story building. Uh, it was opened up in 1907, and it was considered a safe place for working women where they could um, come, uh, they could uh, have food, there was a cafeteria there, uh, there was educational classes, there was, um, they could get medical care, and it was a place for them to stay and sleep if they needed to. Uh, over the years, there were over 500 women who became members and who um, were part of the Hale Club. Um, during the, the uh, women's suffrage period, suffragettes here in Norwich routinely had their meetings in the Hale Club. And uh, also during the summer, uh, Gertrude instituted a program where she would bring small groups of women up to Norwich uh, from New York City, which gave them an opportunity to experience open air and, uh, and uh, the city of Norwich at the time and give them a chance to get away from the city. Uh, Norwich at that time was considered to be one of the premier places for people to retire and enjoy the life, the wealth, and the culture that was here. <clears throat> Later on in her life, uh, Gertrude had a spiritual conversion, and she became very interested in the Catholic religion. She joined the Catholic Church, and at one point traveled to New York City and um, took vows to join um, a nunnery in New York. Uh, it was called the Convent of the Sisters of the Reparation. It was located on East 29th Street. And as part of the vows that she took, that included a vow of poverty, which meant that the wealthiest woman in the state of Connecticut needed to get rid of all of her wealth, which is what Gertrude began to do. She donated a million dollars to the Catholic Church. 
Her property located on Washington Street was sold. All of the artwork, her jewelry and so forth was sold off and the proceeds from those sales were given to support the Hale Club. Um, this was a total change uh, for her and people in this area and also in New York who knew Gertrude were absolutely shocked by what she did. One of her dearest friends left. Gertrude said, I have tried all the pleasures of this world that has to offer. All are unsatisfying. My happiness henceforth will lie in following our Lord's footsteps and in the laboring for others. Um, it was a year of, uh, let's see, there was a, a one year between giving her initial vows and when she had to take the, her final vows. And unfortunately, Gertrude, before she could give her final obligations and take her final vows, um, Gertrude had heart failure and uh, her heart just gave out at that point and she died on December 23rd, two days before Christmas 1920. And uh, one of the comments in hearing of her death, one of the comments uh, by one of her friends who were, was a member of the Hale Club, uh, upon hearing of her death, she's quoted in the local newspaper as saying, here was a rare soul touching many lives at varying angles and leaving an impression upon many hearts, now tender at her death. The beauty of service to minister unto others, such was always her delight. So we're standing by the memorial for the Beckwith family, and I want to talk just a little bit about uh, Herbie Beckwith, who was one of the sons um, of the family. <clears throat> when the Civil War broke out, um, Herbie was uh, very much enthusiastic and wanted to join uh, the Army. But he was only 16 years old, and his parents were dead set against that. So after much debate, though, Herbie was able to volunteer. He joined the 10th Connecticut Volunteers under Colonel Russell. And for the next two years, he went off to fight the Civil War. Uh, he acquitted himself quite well in the battles of Roanoke Island, uh, New Bern, and Kingston. And uh, after two years in uh, 1863, uh, he mustered out of the army as uh, 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 his rank, he had made the rank of Sergeant Major. So apparently uh, his enthusiasm for joining up and fighting the Civil War hadn't been uh, dulled at all by his two years of experience in the Connecticut Volunteers. And against the wishes of his father, who begged him not to go back into the army, uh, Herbie ran off. He went up to Massachusetts, where he enlisted in the 2nd Massachusetts Heavy Artillery. Um, and he was soon sent off to Camp O'Rourke, which was near Norfolk, Virginia. And in February 1864, his regiment was ordered to Plymouth, North Carolina, uh, in the Battle of Fort, Fort Wenzel's. Uh, the fort was attacked in April, and young Beckworth, along with many others, was captured. <clears throat> uh, Herbie was sent to Andersonville down in Georgia, where he spent the next five months. And while he was in Andersonville, Herbie kept a journal, and I can read some of what uh, he wrote at the time. Um, he says, this is a miserable place. He writes, so little care is taken of it, especially of the sick who die in large numbers. Uh, exposure soon wore down his youth, his youthful health. And on uh, the 4th of July, 1864, he writes, this most glorious day has passed in almost total misery. 
It's the most miserable place on earth. And he often writes about the lack of food, um, with the exception of maybe occasional piece of rotted bacon. <clears throat> Homesick and longing to return to his hometown, one Sunday he writes, I fancy to hear the bells of Norwich. Few people were re actually aware of what went on in Andersonville until uh, some of the troops, uh, through a prisoner exchange, were able to get out and tell the story. Um, on September 12, 1864, Herbie was released from the prisoner from the prison at Andersonville in a prisoner exchange, and uh, he traveled north to Annapolis, Maryland. Um, where his health at that time had been worn down. Uh, his lungs were in very bad shape. On a December 24th, um, he was placed in a hospital. Uh, but pale and weak, with his lungs almost gone from the effect of the prison life, Herbie Beckworth died on December 30th, 1864, and he was 19 years old. So sad story about Herbert Beckwith, who really wanted to uh, join the army, fight for the North against his parents' most um, vehement wishes not to go. Uh, but he did, and he died uh, because of his exposure at Andersonville at age 19. Well, our final stop today is uh, by the family plot of the Roth family. And I want to talk about Stephen B. Roth, who was one of the members of the Roth family. Stephen was born here in Norwich in 1829, and uh, he was a self-taught man uh, very, with very little education. Uh, at a young age, he took a job in a general store where he made $6 a month. Uh, at 19, uh, he became the first mail agent for the Norwich Worcester Railroad. And it's here, working for the Norwich Worcester Railroad, that he learned his, uh, a lot about business and in sharpened his business sense, if you will. Um, he traveled to Chicago, where he worked for the uh, Illinois Central Railroad. And in the stockyards, he became what they called a livestock agent. So in other words, he had control of the livestock that was placed on the trains and so forth. And apparently, John had a very um, magnetic personality as he became very good friends with Marshall Field, John B. Sherman, and uh, the father of the stockyards, Philip Armour. Um, uh, Stephen lived a very simple life, saved all of his pennies, and uh, accumulated a huge amount of wealth over his lifetime. In the summers, Stephen would come back to Norwich to visit with his family. He had sisters and uh, relatives, nephews, and so forth here in the city. And whenever he came back to visit, he always dressed very plainly, very simply, and he never made mention of uh, the uh, financial wealth that he had accumulated. So his relatives here really thought that uh, he wasn't doing very well at all. But uh, early in uh, July of 1903, uh, Stephen made a visit to Norwich. He was getting on in years, and he was thinking of retiring. And uh, he came back in that July and visited his relatives here in Norwich. And he surprised him. He surprised them by giving away all of his wealth, his millions that he had collected, he gave to his family. And in the local newspapers, we read that he says, I have had fun accumulating the money and now I want to see what my relatives will do with it. I want to see the results of helping out my relatives and see their happiness. <clears throat> and this distribution of funds, which was administered through the Thames National Bank, came as a total surprise to these people. Uh, his widowed sister 
and two brothers each received $250,000. Now you have to remember this is at a time where the average person earned $200 a year. So this was a huge amount of money. <clears throat> and there were other cousins and nieces that received the money. He wanted to emulate the philosophy of Andrew Carnegie to die poor and um, that's when he announced his intention to give away millions of dollars to his family. The story was picked up certainly here in Norwich, but as far away as the Boston Herald, the Boston Globe had a picture of Stephen who retired here in Norwich and the picture showed him sitting on his front porch enjoying the rest of his life and peace and, uh, and enjoying a simplified life, I think, as well. So that concludes our tour of the Yannick Cemetery here in Norwich, Connecticut. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you were able to learn something about the uh, death and burial traditions that were followed right here in the 1800s during the Victorian age. And I hope you enjoyed some of the stories of the people who lived right here in Norwich and who now rest in Yantic Cemetery. These old cemeteries are really just like outdoor museums. So they're filled with history, there's genealogy, there's art, there's sculpture that you can find here in these old Victorian cemeteries. So I would encourage you to come here and spend some time and wander around, read what's on some of these old monuments, and um, take a look at the way uh, people memorialized uh, these folks who lived right here in Norwich back in the 1800s. Uh, it's really a peaceful place where you can walk and learn quite a bit about the folks that lived 100, 150, 200 years ago.